Um, so just to um, establish my Batman fan creds, uh, this is um, this is Halloween uh, 1968 in thank you uh, in uh, West Lawn, Pennsylvania, which is a suburb of Reading, which is a satellite city of Philadelphia. So that is my brother on the left, that is me on the right, and that is my mom in the middle, and she uh, made these Halloween costumes for us from scratch. So um, thank you, Mom. Uh, so I've just been this huge Batman fan since, uh, I mean, what am I here? I'm four. Um, and this, of course, is when the TV show with Adam West was still on primetime. And my brother was two years older than me, and he was totally into it. So uh, um, therefore, I was into it, too. And I never really sort of got over it. I've been a Batman fan ever since. So uh, fast forward to 2012, um, DC Comics decided to revive a series that they had done called Batman Black and White, which was really, really cool. It's an anthology story series um, of eight page stories uh, that would be in, in black and white. and. And the idea was they would get talent that couldn't um, really commit to more than that. Um, so it's one thing uh, to try and get, say, Neil Adams to do a Batman series. It's another to say, all right, he'll do an eight-page story. Um, anyway, so they asked me to write one, which I did. And it was drawn by a wonderful artist named Michael Cho. Now, what I did not realize was that when the book, when issue one, which I did the first story of, finally came out, uh, almost two years ago to the day, it came out in, at the end of September in 2013. And what DC Comics did was issue um, a blank sketch variant. Now. I'm not entirely sure of the origin of the blank sketch variant, but I think Marvel started it with the ultimate Spider-Man uh, in the early aughts. And the idea was that in addition to the regular version of the comic, they would issue one with a sort of toothy paper that just had the logo of the comic on it. And, uh, and it was like an extra dollar, and you would buy it and then take it to a convention and get your, you know, wait in line and get an artist to draw on it or sketch on it. And I remember at the time when the Ultimate Spider Man one came out, I thought, that is the dumbest idea I've ever heard in my life. Like, who's going to do this? Um, but it proved to be um, very popular. And of course, without telling me, I'm only one of the writers, um, DC did this with this comic that I participated in called Batman Black and White. So I only found out about this by going to New York Comic Con in early October 2013 and getting the notion of I would buy up as many of these as I could. And initially I thought, well, I'll just try and get people who participated in the issue to draw on them for me. And it soon quickly exploded from there. Um, but at the, at the convention was Neil Adams. And he was sitting there at his Neil Adams booth. And I waited for an hour uh, to get to see him. And uh, this fittingly became my first one. He was a, he was a childhood uh, hero of mine. And he, plus he has a story in the book. It's a very weird story, but it's beautifully drawn. Um, and, uh, and so I was sort of, in a way, I guess, off and running. Uh, another guy who was at the convention uh, that year is Dave Bullock. And uh, he was an artist on the Batman animated TV series. Amazing guy, lives in Jersey, is so good. And um, so sort of the initial idea was that 
the artist would have to draw onto the comic book itself. Um, and it really it was supposed to be black and white, as you will see some some of the artists uh, reneged on that. But um, you know, I decided the more I got into this, the more it became this obsession that uh, I couldn't sort of give up. So I put on uh, there was an automatic search on eBay for Batman black and white blank variant copies. And uh, to this day, I don't know how many of these they printed, 5,000 maybe? And I would buy these up, and I decided to make it this sort of uh, crusade, so to speak, to um, get as many artists as I could find to draw on these uh, comics. And, and it sort of grew from that into... Uh, it became a way for me to introduce myself to artists who I'd always wanted to meet and didn't have a reason or the courage to do so. Uh, this is Klaus Janssen. This was at the same convention. Uh, he is best known as the inker of The Dark Knight Returns. The, um, and there'll be a reference to that later. There's a reference to everything, as you will see. Um, and this is Mike Allred, who's a wonderful artist who I had wanted to contact forever. And uh, he's been doing the covers for Batman 1966. So here's his, here's his Adam West. And he's, he's on the West Coast. And then this is a, an Italian artist named Simone Bianchi. Um, I didn't really specify whether... If the artist wanted to go onto the back of, of the cover, they could. Um, and as you'll see upstairs, a, a, a bunch of them did. And again, this is a guy who, whose work I just thought was terrific, and I, I, I needed a reason to try and make contact with him. So went onto his website, and and uh, and that was the result. Uh, this is a dear friend of mine, Charles Burns, uh, an amazing artist uh, who I published at Pantheon, Black Hole, and X'd Out. And um, he's always been uh, influenced by Bob Kane, although you wouldn't really know it by looking at his work. But this is a direct sort of homage, shall we, shall we say. Um, this is Detective Comics number 44 um, from, from the 40s, uh, which is obviously what he was drawing upon, literally. Uh, this is uh, Drew Friedman, um, who... Uh, I was amazed didn't tag it to a celebrity. Um, he does these hilarious, wonderful, brilliant portraits of famous people, um, often looking very silly. But but this, in his way, is actually really, this is his version of Batman. It's not Adam West playing Batman or any of the actors. And it's, it's an ink wash. Um, he's just an amazing, amazing guy. This is Dave Gibbons of Watchmen fame. I had done a book for him about the making of the Watchmen comic. Uh, so I had some access to him. Really, really nice guy. Uh, so this is basically um, Batman as Rorschach um, doing a, an interrogation of the suspect. Uh, and it, this was the first one that started introducing color, which I never discouraged. I just kind of left the uh, title to be self-explanatory. Um, this is this incredible woman, Olivia. Uh, she goes professionally by Olivia. Her full name is on the placard upstairs. And uh, she's done... Um, work for Playboy since the 70s. Uh, she's sort of like uh, Vargas only now. And uh, I couldn't believe, I, um, I wrote to her at the suggestion of, a, of a, design, a mutual friend named Pash, whose work you will see a little bit later. And he said, why don't you ask Olivia? And I said, how would I ever get Olivia to do this? And he said, well, she, she's really great and I think she likes your work. And I wrote to her and she said, you know, I've really been into Michelle Pfeiffer lately uh, as Catwoman. So uh, what if I did that? And I said, perfect. Um, 
uh, there are three artists who cheated and did not actually draw on the comic itself. Um, a lot of the artists complained about drawing on the comic itself because it's really antithetical to how comic book covers are actually made. Um, <clears throat> and if not in this room particularly, but if you go upstairs and um, in, into the men's room, you will see uh, a couple examples of actual comics pages and Usually they're drawn about at 150 to 200 percent of the size on real actual artboard with plenty of room for what we call bleed uh, of going off the edge. Um, so the idea of getting somebody to actually draw on the comic became paramount to me. But these are the three artists that that for whatever reason, didn't do it. The, the first is uh, Dutch cartoonist Joost Swarte. I had been wanting a Joost Swarte Batman drawing ever since I saw his work in Raw magazine uh, when I was in college. And finally, I cornered him at MoCA in 2014 and uh, got him to do it. And I gave him the comic book, but I don't think he really understood what the deal was and did this separate drawing but it's, it's perfect. It's actually absolutely what I love about his work. Um, <clears throat> this, this is an artist designer named Stephen Doyle uh, who decided to make a sculptural bust, um, which just blew me away because that's not at all what he really does for a living. He does kind of paper sculpture stuff for uh, the New Yorker <clears throat> when he's not operating his own thriving um, design business called Drentel Partners. And way back when, when it was Drentel Doyle, he created the look of Spy Magazine way back in the 80s. Uh, but he just decided he wanted to do a sculpture. So you can go upstairs and see it. And then he just photographed it and put it in the context with the, uh, with the logo. And then my dear friend and uh, one of my favorite artists in the whole world, Chris Ware, uh, would not deign to draw onto the comic and created this piece of art instead. And so when you go upstairs to the show, you will see this is sort of at the opening to it. And you can see the size that most of these artists actually like to work in. And <clears throat> I think Chris hated the logo so much <clears throat> that he just didn't want to deal with it. Um, I have been trying to find on the web, this is, this is sort of in the style of Sheldon Moldoff um, in the 50s, uh, what, what this comic book cover actually refers to. Uh, I can't, I, and I haven't to this day been, in, been able to find it. But basically, if you look closely, you can see that Robin is actually tied to the chair. Um, and Batman is instructing him, and you can't read what he's written on the blackboard, but it says, number one, Batman is good. Number one, number two, everybody else is bad. Um, a, Robin is good, but only if Batman says he is. Three, don't call the police. And four, redraw the logo if you don't like it. Okay, so again, you know, like, Waiting in line for one of my heroes at, at, at the Artist Alley in Comic-Con, Howard Chaikin. Uh, really interesting guy. And uh, I wait for, again, like an hour. And then I get to the front of the line. He knows my work. Sure, he'll do one of these for me. And, and, uh, and so I get this JPEG back. And, and, I, and I said, well, uh, you, you have to sort of deal with the logo. It can't be floating in front of his face like this. So uh, this was a, a theme that came up quite a bit. So he wrote back and he said, okay, I'll do a patch. And so if you look at this upstairs, you'll see that he cut out a piece of paper uh, and pasted it on it and then redrew the face literally on, on top of the logo. Uh, this is another case of that. This is a, a wonderful uh, young illustrator out of the Philippines named um, Kirby Rosanis. I found out about his work from uh, a, a design website called Design Taxi. And they just said, you know, here's an illustrator who we think is great. And so I went on the web, found his website, wrote to him. 
he was very excited, said, I'd love to do this. I would love to do this. And, and I'm going to say this a couple of times. Go upstairs and look at the detail on this thing. It's truly astonishing, except I said, uh, it's great, but we need to pull Batman's head into the foreground. And so he did so that we can see the ears and see all of that on top of it. This is, I believe this is all pencil. Um, I could be wrong about that, but again, uh, check it out. Um, it's really terrific. So references. Um, this is one of the Batman serials by Columbia Pictures in the 1940s. And, you know, really cheesy, but I, I growing up as a kid, uh, the idea that Batman was in the movies at all, especially in the 40s, I thought was thrilling. Um, and then the artist Lou Brooks, who I thought, always thought was terrific, used this as the basis um, for doing his. And then there were the other serials. Um, this is John Cassidy. And and he's referencing um, the other ser the other Batman serial Columbia serial uh, previous to the other one <clears throat> starring Lewis Wilson and Douglas Croft, and so he tilted the the cover on its side and did this this advertisement poster on it, um, and this is that's his reference. Um, this is, I believe, 1943. That's how Batman first looked in the movies. And then uh, this wonderful illustrator named Randy Glass, um, who I worked with on a, on a book called True Prep. Um, I, I definitely wanted him to do something. And he got fixated on this fan statue of the same thing. Um, and... Uh, he sent me this picture and he said, I want to do this. And I said, well, if that's what you want to do, then do it, I guess. Randy is one of the people who does the stipple portraits of um, everybody for the Wall Street Journal. And so he kind of did his version of that. And it's hard, it's hard to see, but again, go upstairs and look at this thing. This, uh, do you remember being in junior high and doing pointillism? Uh, this is pointillism taken to an art that is truly, truly astonishing. And uh, again, he hated the paper surface, couldn't work with it, so he did this drawing on a separate piece of paper, cut it out, and then pasted it onto um, the comic. And there's another person who did that who I will show you shortly. Uh, this is a fantastic illustrator from Vancouver named Ryan Heshka, who's published several children's books. And um, he loves this crazy, wonderful era of Batman from 1939, from the first 10 issues of Detective Comics, when Batman still had guns and would shoot the, uh, would shoot the villains. Um, here he is doing that uh, with um, a villain named Dr. Death. We will also see him in a little bit later. Uh, but this is, this, is a, this is a gouache painting. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, and you should take a look at it again uh, upstairs. Here are two other pieces of his that I had seen on the web prior to that, uh, which sort of introduced me to him. And I've been trying to sell DC Comics on the idea of doing a Batman graphic novel with this guy, um, which is proving difficult. But uh, if we would ever make it work, it would be absolutely great. Um, I loved this so much I bought it. It's, it's an oil painting. It's about that big. Uh, this is a woman named Celia Calle. Uh, I hope that's how I pronounce it, C-A-L-L-E. E. And uh, again, here's a, there was an artist I saw on, at Artist Alley uh, at San, uh, the New York Comic Con. And uh, I contracted her to do this. And about a year and a half later, she finally delivered it. But um, it's, I just think it's wonderful. It's basically what if Egon Sheila had drawn Catwoman um, in 1910? Um, Really great, and the buckle around the neck I think is a great detail. 
Uh, this is Alison Bechtel, who oh. is now best known as the author of Fun Home, the winner of the Tony Award for Best Musical, which is absolutely great, um, by the way. Uh, I've actually seen it three times. Um, and I couldn't believe she agreed to do this. This is really funny. But actually, the she then she did the back cover, which I think is even better. Uh, so, you know, they're in the off hours working out. Uh, and of course, on the TV is Anderson Cooper. Uh, and that actually led me to realize that um, I've been doing work for Anderson's, uh, well, not only for Anderson, but for his mother, Gloria Vanderbilt, for many years, and, and uh, in terms of book covers, and had gotten to know her, and she's really, really a terrific person. Um, she's also 92, um, which is uh, not a secret, but pretty extraordinary. And so I wrote to her to see if she would do one of these for me, and she said, sure, but you're going to have to really give me some guidance because I don't know what to do. Um, and I had just been to a recent show of hers where she had used, she, she does pastels, but she also uses a lot of glitter. So I researched this on the web. This is the current Batwoman mask that they are using uh, uh, for DC Comics um, for the past couple of years. So I very carefully mapped this out for her. And uh, this is what she did. But what I <clears throat> especially really wanted was for her to do a lip imprint uh, using her favorite lipstick of her actual lips on a piece of paper. I actually wanted her to kiss the comic itself. Um, she couldn't quite do that because it, it would be once and done. And if she got it wrong, she was, she was worried that uh, it would be in the wrong, the placement would be wrong. So she kissed a piece of paper and then cut it out and put it on. But if you think about who those lips have kissed uh, over the 20th century, um, Howard Hughes, Marlon Brando, Frank Sinatra, um, <clears throat> the list goes on, and uh, Leop Leopold Stokowski. Uh, I just thought it was this amazing kind of connection connection to the past. She did an incredible job, um, and I just sort of adore her for it. Uh, this was done two floors up here at MoCA Fest 2014. This is an artist named Robert Williams, and he did this under tremendous duress. Uh, he was very gracious, uh, and he was a guest of MoCA Fest, and um, there was, there was a time, as in the past two years, where I was carrying around one of these blanks with me all the time, just in case I would run into an artist that I would want to do one. And um, I managed to uh, get this done in about 20 minutes, or he did, um, and it only cost me two drinks uh, and, a, and a couple of bucks. Um, and he kept saying, I just, I don't do this. I don't do this. And I said, it's all right. I know. Don't worry about it. And, but, and yet he wouldn't stop. Um, anyway, his work is great and obviously much, much, much more detailed than this. But, um, these are my three, this is the first of my three real artists, uh, who show in galleries. Um, <clears throat> the second is Raymond Pettibone, who was giving a talk a year ago, at the Brooklyn Comics Festival, and I he was on he was definitely on my list. So I went to the Brooklyn Comics Festival. I sat for his talk, and uh, towards the end, he said, "I have a new pen that I made out of a pipe cleaner, and I want to test it. Does anybody have something to help me test it with?" And I leaped up um, with my blank. Batman black and white, and uh, gave it to him. And he had said in his talk that um, he liked the work of Frank Robbins, uh, Batman in the 70s, which I definitely did too. And uh, so I just did a quick search on my phone. I found this. I held it up for him. And again, I think this took all of five minutes. And you, you probably look at it and say, well, of course, it only took five minutes. 
but I think it's really kind of great. Um, and I made sure that he, he initialed it so that it's um, real and documented. Uh, but I, I just, I really sort of love that. And then um, this dear friend of, of, of mine and my husband's, the painter Philip Perlstein, uh, who is, so he's the person in the show who's also hanging at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, uh, as well as many other, uh, <clears throat> his work is, is everywhere. Um, and he agreed to do it, but he said, you need to give me something to draw from. So this is a, a Batman doll, a Batman doll that I actually helped design and, and uh, for a project years before. So I sent him that, and I said, just draw this. And then, and then he did this, which I thought was great. Um, it's almost as if one of the villains is, is holding a voodoo doll of Batman and poking pins into it. If any of you are not familiar with what Philip's work actually looks like, uh, here's an example. Um, really, really beautiful and incredible stuff. And again, he's, he's up there. He's like 86, 87 years old. So it's very grateful to him. Uh, switching gears completely, this is Jeffrey Brown, who um, he was this scrappy little indie cartoonist who hit it big with his books about Darth Vader and his little daughter and Darth Vader and his little son. And... Uh, so this is his little bat cave vista. Um, and I love, you know, tiny little tot Robin and the penguin tugging at his foot. This is Christoph Niemann, wonderful illustrator, uh, whose work is everywhere. Uh, this is Jay Lee. I had chased this down for about two years. Um, he's a terrific uh, uh, illustrator, most recently on... Um, Batman and Superman official title, um, and uh, this is this is probably my favorite drawing of Robin in the show. Just the gesture of it is just really really sweet, really great. Um, this is Peter Cooper, uh, who's my age but an old lefty, um, and and he he used to do Spy versus Spy for MAD for many, many, many years um, in, in this kind of, he used to do this spray paint style, which he gave up because of course it was killing him. And um, he just, he, but he acquiesced to do a spray paint piece for this. Um, this is fabulous Dave Plunkert out of um, Baltimore. This is Seth, who's actually drawn Batman for me on more occasions than he'd like to admit. But um, this is, it, if you look at this upstairs, this is also a gouache painting, which is really fantastic. Um, this is Howard Cruz. If you go up two flights outside of the, he did Stuck Rubber Baby for, for Vertigo um, and was um, with the, the Zap guys in the 60s. Um, so there's a wonderful page from Stuck Rubber Baby, two floors up outside the one office there. You can check that out. Um, evil joker dentist. Um, this was just me walking down Artist Alley, New York Comic Con, this guy, um, Chadwick Haverland from Oklahoma City. He had done one of these of Adam West and he was selling quote prints of them, i.e. color Xeroxes. And I said, do you take commissions? And he said, well, yeah, but you have to give me something really specific to draw from. So I gave him this. Uh, and I always loved that in the show when they took out the bat shield um, and, and to a, you know, not get shot at. But that's pencil on paper. Uh, truly, truly amazing. Um, great stuff. This is a woman named Vanessa Del Rey. I was at TCAF, Toronto Arts and Comics Festival, Comics and Art Festival. Uh, I, I didn't even know who she was, and uh, I just saw some of her work, and I said, could you do one of these for me? And she said, yeah, come back in two hours. And there it was, and there she is. Um, this is a guy named Dexter Vines. This is at uh, New York Comic Con. He works a lot with Ed McGinnis. Um, this is Bob Camp, who helped. He was one of the art directors on Ren and Stimpy, which was a great um, love of mine in the early 
in the early 90s. So he does Ren and Stimpy. Batman as Ren and Stimpy and vice versa. Uh, this is J.G. Jones out of Philadelphia. Um, this is Dave McKean from Sandman fame. Sweet guy. Very, very strange drawing, but um, I was really appreciative that he did it. This was a great... Uh, this again, there, there's a guy named Lars Litaru out of Philadelphia whose spot illustrations in the New York Times I had admired for years. Um, and I could never think of a project to work on with him until this. And I had no idea whether he'd be into it or not. And this was a great, this is probably the, the nicest revelation to me of the whole project. Um, it's just a beautiful, beautiful drawing. Uh, again, everybody hated working with that logo and trying, you know, to supplant it or hide behind it. This is Michael Cho, who I actually did the story with and whose book Shoplifter I published uh, two falls ago. This is Dan Klaus, who I can't believe agreed to do it. Um, This is uh, Frank Quitely, uh, it's a pen name, uh, Vin Deegan out of Glasgow, Scotland. Um, and he drew upon the actual content of the story I wrote, which is about <clears throat> Robin and Superman searching for Batman who was missing. So that's on the front cover, and then inside the back cover is where he actually is. Um, and this sort of pertains to the story. This is Gary Panter whose work I had loved, again, since I saw it in Raw in the early 80s. Adrian Tomina, Optic Nerve. This is Gengaro Tagame, who I published with Picture Box. Um, naughty, gay, Japanese genius. This is another, uh, this is Jiraiya uh, from that same group. Uh, again, this is Pencil, Pencil on, on the cover. And then this is Jiro Kawada, whose work I um, revived in Batmanga. And again, he's in the upper, upper 70s. And uh, I was amazed that he would even be able to draw Batman again. But he, but he did. He drew Batman in Japan in 1966. Then the New Yorker crowd. I had wanted to uh, get Roz Chas to, to do a drawing of Batman and Robin for me forever. And she said, you don't understand. If I do Batman and Robin, they'll be on a couch in Queens arguing. And I said, yes, that's precisely what I want. This is Barry Blitt, who does all those fantastic, uh, timely, I guess, op-ed covers for the New Yorker, doing Bat Hamlet. This is Myra Kalman. Uh, intense, brilliant, wonderful. Um, this is a, a Gary Gianni, whose work I had admired forever. He was the last professional artist to draw Prince Valiant. And um, I just saw him at San Diego Comic-Con in his booth. And I said, would you do this? And uh, he did this really terrific sort of spin on, on the concept. Um, this is like done in the style of a, of a uh, illustration from the 20s pulps. This is Orhan Pamuk. Uh, so he's the only person in the show who has won the Nobel Prize for Literature, um, whose covers I've been doing for a long time. Uh, this is about a year ago. And uh, Right place, right time. He loves to draw, and I said, "Go for it." This is actually echoes um, a, a, a panel that appears later in the comic book itself. And then um, this is my friend Pash from LA, who's a designer. And uh, last June, I was out there on business, and we got together, and I showed him the book of these, and he's like, "Oh, I would love to do one." And I thought, oh, man, uh, OK. Because I didn't, I know he's a good designer, but I didn't understand if he'd be able to draw anything or not. Well, this is truly remarkable. What this is, um, this is it's a reference to the classic uh, Frank Miller cover for The Dark Knight Returns number one. But what he did was he transcribed the first couple of pages of dialogue <clears throat> from the comic and did this combination 
typography and illustration for it. Uh, and again, this warrants really close inspection upstairs. Um, and then he, for practice, he did two others with the black and white concept. And um, just absolutely beautiful, total surprise. Had no idea that he was capable of that. And then um, I went to Art Spiegelman's uh, opening at the Jewish Museum in the fall of 2013 and uh, managed to slip him a copy of, of the blank. And I thought, I will never see it again. He agreed to do it. And then a year and a half later, he said, oh, I did it. Is it OK to do it in color? I said, sure. Um, and that was, that was a real treat. And then his wife, Francoise Mouly, who's a wonderful designer and art director, did, uh, did one for me as well. Um, and then uh, my friend Alex Ross, um, whose work is more in the tradition of what's in, in this room, uh, absolutely brilliant. And I did a book with him called Mythology. And he, he agreed to do it. And he, but he usually doesn't take requests, as it were. Uh, but he said, well, what should I do? And I said, you know, I don't think you've ever done your version of the needle cover of Detective Number 35. Um, this is one of my favorite Batman covers of all time. Again, this is in the last throes of the first year when Batman's, you know, really mean and scary and has these big ears, um, and that wouldn't happen again for a while. And he's like, okay. Um, so this is just really amazing. And again, this is all ink wash on, on paper on the cover on the cover of the book. Um, definitely one of the highlights of the show. And, um, and then I realized that I needed to cough one of these up too. Uh, and as per usual, I just thought my way around the fact that I could not actually draw. Uh, so I knew that the actual real cover of the book was underneath the blank um, and that bats are at least the Batman logo is kind of wonderfully symmetrical. So I just did this um, sort of, I mapped it out and cut it out and, and did colored pencil around the, uh, around the hole. But uh, um, that's what I decided I would do for my own, especially since nobody else did that. So um, that, that gives you a sort of taste for the show. That's about half the covers that are in it. Um, I want to thank Annel Miller and everybody at the Society of Illustrators for agreeing to, to mount this show. And when you see it upstairs, it's, it's really sort of wonderfully eye-popping. The shade of red they selected for the background, um, it's, it's terrific. So the plan, once I got a bunch of these in hand, the plan became I need to do actually do something with them. It started out as a sort of fan geek project. And uh, about two years ago, I was asked to be on the board of something called the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund, which is more or less the ACLU of comics. And they're an anti-censorship group. And, uh, and this week is Banned Books Week. So um, read your Huck Finn and what have you. Um, but what we, what we're gonna, what we wanna do and what we're going to do is collect all of these into a book with the blessing of DC Comics, which is um, difficult. But um, and a year from now, uh, we're gonna. The book is scheduled to come out, and it will. All the proceeds will go to the CBLDF. Um, so that is that is the idea. So. Um, Thank you all for coming. If anybody has any questions or, or anything like that, um, I'm happy to answer them. And if, if there's any of you who have not been to the Society of Illustrators before, uh, welcome. It's, it's really a, an amazing thing. Um, there's you know four floors of five, I guess, including downstairs, of amazing exhibits going on at any time. Um, in here is, is an exhibit from the, from the um, collection of, I mean, it's, it's magazine illustration, but I think when the lights come up and you take a good look at it, you'll see that it's much more than that. I'm, I am next to an N.C. Wyeth painting 
right here. Um, and there's an enormous Norman Rockwell over the bar two floors up, which I would uh, encourage you all to check out. So um, thanks a lot. And if you have any Q&A, um, let me know. Yes. That's a good, that's a really good question. Our, our, right. Um, the, so far, no. Uh, the question is, is DC sort of like vetoing any of the covers because of content? Obviously, Art Spiegelman has Batman kissing Robin. There's another one by Maurice Velacoupe, the wonderful uh, Toronto cartoonist upstairs, which is a little more explicit. Uh, Batman and Robin are in bed, shirtless but they have their masks on. Um, so we'll see. I mean, it's, it's so far, I mean, the, the understanding is that that's n not going to be part of the equation, that they, that they really cannot, um, they can't exclude, exclude any of them. And that's correct. That's correct. And the other thing is, uh, Jim Lee, who you may or may not know, is on the board of the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund. Well, he's about as big a honcho at, at, at DC as one can be. So presumably he's, he's behind this, and, and uh, we'll see. It, it, in its own way, it's going to be quite a coup to, to pull this book off with their blessing because they're also, the idea is that they will also list it for distribution within their channels, which would be very, very important. Um, and we do basically one printing and you can order it through Diamond and, and see, you know, I, I have no idea what the first, what the printing number would be, but I would think it would be pretty high um, because there's a lot of these artists here um, who have never drawn Batman and never will again. And <laughs> um, it was funny, my Alex had said to me, he's a very candid person, and he said, you realize this is all about you. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, I, I suppose so. In a certain way, it is. Um, so we'll see. Yes. Well, Alex, you were late. I led with Neil Adams. Uh, um, you know, there, there is a laundry list of people who have said yes and who have copies and haven't delivered yet. Um, and Jim Lee is one of them. So um, we'll see. You know, everyone's busy. This is a weird thing. Um, I tried to I tried to get as this was going along I tried to get a, a good mix of people who drew Batman professionally for a living and then people who didn't at all um, and you know things that are really serious and cool and then things that are whimsical and funny and there's two which I did not show that are well purely typographical Paula Cher created an alphabet and Debbie Millman uh, did, a, did a quote in type and pencil by Neil Gaiman. Um, so in terms of the book, we have till the end of January to collect any other ones um, that we're going to collect. Uh, but there's 88 upstairs. I've just gotten three more in. I would like to make it an even 100 for the book. Um, so we'll see. What's that? Paul Pope is supposed to deliver his damn book. So we'll see. I think I'm going to see him next week. So, Yes. Has anyone said flat out no? Um, a couple people, yes, have said no. <laughs> Uh, one of them I just gave up right away because it was like, no, I can't do it. Um, 
And the the annoying thing is when they say yes, and then I remind them, and like yes, and I, so there's a couple people that I've reminded three or four times, and then it's just like okay, let's just give up because I've been in that situation too. People ask me to do all kinds of stuff, and you always want to say yes because you want to do something good, and then it sort of rears its ugly head. But it's but it's also you know squeaky wheel gets the grease. And the other thing is like I put once I've accumulated. A, a bunch of these, I, I would do really good color Xeroxes, Xeroxes and put them in an album and take that around with me and show the artists and then that f that freaked them out. And one, one of whom, unfortunately, was Matt Groening. Like, I could have gotten a Matt Groening five-minute sketch and then I showed, them what everybody, showed him what everybody else was doing. He's like, oh that you want a real drawing. I said, yeah. And he said, okay, well, then I'll have to take this home with me and, and work on it there. And that was a year and a half ago. So. Uh, that's an interesting question. I think that would be another show. Like I have, I, that would be another show. Uh, I, I saw the, the show in the summer that Craig Yo did here. Uh, just his personal collection of stuff, uh, which was just wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Um, that would be something I would have to talk to the, these guys down the line. The, the, what I really like about this is that they're, they're all united by the format. Um, and so when you go and see it, you, you, there's a commonality to it in terms of they were all in the same boat to do, this, to do it this particular way. And then if I started just showing other artwork that I owned, it wouldn't have the same meaning wouldn't have the same meaning to me. But, you know, who, who, who knows uh, down, down the line? Yes, yes. That's a sort of treasured thing that I put together. It's hard to explain, but um, once the design of All-Star uh, All Superman number 10 came out, I bought up all the art for it. And anyway, um, we'll see, maybe. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Okay, so a week a week from tomorrow night is the official opening reception for the show. That's October 7th, 6 to 8. Uh, I know for a fact a bunch of the artists are going to come. Um, and that th the significance of that date is that New York Comic Con starts the next day. So we were hoping that we would get some out-of-towners in for that. And then there's going to be a Halloween party. So I just want to say thank you again to to Anel. Um, it's just uh, this weird obsession I've had, and that, but to see it, you know, it's you know, you go into an art gallery and you see it up on a wall, and it's behind glass, and there's a little card that says who did it, and all of a sudden it takes on a I don't know deeper meaning, or it's re it's re it's really fun. Please. Yeah, so, and, and, and again, when the lights come up, take a look at this show. It's just, it's beyond. It's really, really great. Thanks again. Thank you.